Welcome to another tutorial video. This one will be all about non-controlling interests and consolidation accounting. Non-controlling interests were formerly known as minority interests, and you'll still see that name in some places, but the new name is non-controlling interests, and that's what we'll be using here. This is a direct follow-up to one of the previous tutorials on equity investments, also known as associate companies, because here it's the opposite concept, and we'll be discussing what happens when a company owns more than 50% or greater than or equal to 50% of another company. Now we get a lot of questions about non-controlling interests, how they work in the financial statements, how to model them and so on. And we do have dedicated tutorials. We have a full case study on these two European energy companies, Fordham and Uniper, and what happens when they go from a minority stake to a majority stake, how it's reflected on the statements and how to set up everything. Here though, I'm going to cover the key points in around 15 or 20 minutes and explain the bare minimum you need to know for interviews, as well as a few of the more advanced points around this topic. Non-controlling interests are difficult mostly because of naming conventions and confusing terminology, not because the ideas are hard. So let's start with the very basics. If you have a parent company shown here, and then they own a majority stake in another company, the subco or subsidiary company, maybe they own 70% or 80% or something like that. The non-controlling interest refers to the part of the subco that they do not own. So the 20% or 30% that they do not own. A lot of people get this mixed up and they think it's actually referring to the 70 or 80% that they do own, but that's not the case. It's the opposite. It's referring to what they do not own and therefore what they do not control of this other company, the subco. When a parent company owns between 50% and 100% of another company, it has to consolidate that company's financial statements with its own. Now, the tricky part is that even if the parent co only owns 60% or 70% or 80% of subco, you still have to add together 100% of parent co's and 100% of subco's numbers. You will also make some adjustments for subco's net income and dividends. The dividend ones are a bit tricky, so we're going to save them for the full walkthrough of this entire process in a little bit. But the net income one is simple. You just subtract one minus the ownership percentage times subco's net income at the bottom of the combined income statement. So let's go into Excel. I have this intro tab over here. We have parent company, which owns 70% of subsidiary company or subco. It's about four times or three times the size if you judge it by metrics like revenue and net income. So in this scenario, when parent company owns 70%, we literally add together everything that parent company and subco have. Revenue, cost of goods sold, operating expenses, depreciation and amortization. We will sum up everything here to get the operating income. We will also add together the net interest expense and sum these up to get pre-tax income. Income taxes, we could also add together, but since both companies have the same tax rate, I'm just going to take pre-tax income and multiply by parent goes tax rate up there. We can sum these up to get net income. So our combined net income is just both companies' net incomes added together, but then we make one small adjustment down here and we use a negative sign. We take subco's net income and then we multiply by one minus the 70% that parent co owns in subco. We deduct that and then we get a, to a net income to parent of around 55 or 56 million. So we make one very small adjustment but that is really all that happens on the income statement. If you look at metrics like EBIT and EBITDA, you can see that with consolidation accounting, we're literally just adding together EBIT for parent co and subco, and we're also adding together EBITDA for parent co and subco, and that's how we get the combined numbers here. And then we just make the small adjustment at the bottom of the income statement. So that's the bare minimum that you need to know about this topic for interviews. If you wanna go beyond that, we'll cover the more detailed step-by-step -step process in the rest of this tutorial. I'll start off by explaining how non-controlling interests get created and how you adjust the balance sheet and set up the purchase price allocation for these. Then we'll go through the full consolidation on the three financial statements and I'll show you which line items change, which line items are simple additions and which ones require a bit more thought. And then we'll talk about non-controlling interest and valuation and how you might have to adjust for these when you're calculating equity value and enterprise value and related metrics. Let's start with the creation of non-controlling interests here. And to illustrate this, I have over here a combined tab where we have our transaction that we'll be looking at. We also have a parent company and their financials over four years. And then we have a subsidiary company or subco and their financials over four years. Parent co is about 10 times bigger than subco if you go by revenue. 
And we're going to look at the scenario where parent co goes from an existing 30% stake in subco to a 70% stake in subco. As I just said, parent co owns 30%. It has an equity investment for 30% of subco on its balance sheet as a result. And you can see this if you go down to the balance sheet here, the 16 million of equity investments represents the 30% of subco that they own. It's not exactly equal to 30% times subco's market value because of some adjustments that have been made since the acquisition, but that's the idea. This represents the 30%, even though it's not mathematically exactly equal to the 30%. Parentco wants to go to 70%, so it's going to consolidate its statements 100%. Since this acquisition will end up with ownership of at least 50%, we will create goodwill. We'll also create the usual M&A line items like asset write-ups, deferred tax line items, and so on. We're actually going to simplify it here and ignore these, but in a real deal, you would see these items created as well. But just to simplify it and not get too complicated for now, we're going to avoid these and just focus on the goodwill. The other tricky part here is that Parent Co. acquired this 30% stake when Subco was worth a different amount. Specifically, they acquired the stake when Subco was worth only 50 million, but now they're acquiring an additional 40% when Subco is worth 100 or 100 million. And you can see this right up here if you go to the assumptions. They bought this 30% when the cost basis for 100% of Subco was 50, but they're going to go up to 70% when the market cap of Subco is 100 rather than 50. That's going to create some complications and we'll need to make an adjustment for this change or the combined balance sheet will not balance and you'll see an example of that coming up in a few minutes. Now, the goodwill calculation is still based on the equity purchase price for 100% of Subco and a full write down of Subco's common shareholders equity. So let's start setting this up and calculate some of these numbers that are required up at the top first. Let's start with the purchase price for the additional stake. Currently, Subco's market cap is 100. We're assuming no premium to this, so we're just buying this at this 100 market price. And the actual purchase price will be equal to that number times the ownership percentage, the new one, the 70%, minus the old one, the 30%. So we're multiplying this by 40%, we get to 40 million. Now for the goodwill, this is going to be based on 100% of the target's purchase price. So we don't adjust for the 70% or 40% or 30% or anything like that. We're just going to start with the 100% right here. We're going to deduct the seller's common shareholders equity because this gets written down in the transaction. And then we would write off goodwill if the target had any, but they actually do not have any goodwill if you look at their balance sheet right now under non-current assets. So we're just going to say zero for this and then add these up to get the total goodwill created in this deal. Now, the other thing we have to do is look at the premium or discount to the book value of the, of the existing stake. Because when we remove this equity investment and replace it with goodwill and a non-controlling interest, if we are basing these on different market values, the balance sheet is gonna go out of bounds. So we need to look at this premium or discount somewhere. To do that, we're going to take the market cap of Subco, will multiply by the initial stake percentage, the 30%, and then we will subtract the book value of this equity investment, the 16 that's on the balance sheet as of the end of year one. So we have that, and I'll just fix the formatting a little bit here. So all that is set up, we have all our required assumptions. We're not going to modify the income statement in this part, we're just going to modify the balance sheet starting with the asset side. On the balance sheet, we wanna add all of Subco's assets and liabilities to the parents, but we want to exclude their common shareholders equity since it's written down in the deal. Also on the asset side, we have to add in the new goodwill and remove the old equity investment line item and subtract any cash that's being used to fund this deal, this acquisition of this additional 40% stake. So let's go over. On the asset side, a debit is going to increase the line item and a credit is going to reduce it. It's the opposite on the liabilities and equity side, but we're starting with the asset side. So for debits, let's go over and get the year one numbers from Subco and we'll link in their cash, accounts receivable and inventory. We'll also link in their net pp &E, and we will link in their operating lease assets, which is one below that. Now for the goodwill, we will link to the new goodwill that's created in the deal, the 58 right here. And then equity investments, we're not going to increase this by any amount, so I'm just gonna enter a zero right here and we have that. Now on the credit side, the working capital line items, I'm just going to enter zero because these will not have reductions in this deal. And then for the cash, 
we want to go up and we want to get the purchase price for the additional stake and then multiply by the 50% cash we're using to fund this deal. We're going to subtract this 20 million of cash because we're using it to buy this additional stake. And then we can add up everything here to get to our post deal numbers. We have all these and we can copy these down. And then for the goodwill in the credits column here, the target doesn't have any goodwill, so we don't need to make any adjustments here. So I can just enter a zero. And then for the equity investments, this is going away because now we will own over 50% of this company or at least 50% of this company. So I'll take this and record a negative there and then include all these and then add these up and then add up our total assets so we get that. That's the asset side. Let's now go to the liabilities and equity side. We need to add together all of Subco's liabilities. We also need to add any debt or stock used to fund the deal. And we will create a non-controlling interest based on the percent they don't own times Subco's market cap as of this time. We'll also record the premium or discount adjustment here within common shareholders equity so that the balance sheet balances properly. Now on this side, it's the opposite. So in the debit column, I'm gonna say zero for most of these because these are not going away at all in the deal. So I'm just gonna enter zeros. In the credit column though, we need to add in Subco's line items. So let's get their accounts payable and accrued liabilities from year one. And then for total debt, let's go and get that as well. And then operating lease liabilities, let's go and get that. And so we have all those. Now for the new transaction debt, this is the one line item we have to add in. So let's take the purchase price and multiply it by the percent debt used right there. And then we can add up all of these numbers. And then we'll get all these and we have that. For total liabilities, we'll just add up total current plus total non-current liabilities. And then under equity, nothing is going to be reduced with the common shareholders equity. Same with non-controlling interest. So I'll just enter zeros for both of these. For the non-controlling interest, we have to create the new line item here right now. So let's go up and take the market cap of Subco and then multiply by one minus the new ownership percentage. So we get this. Now at this point, if you go in and you try to add up everything here, you'll see the problem very quickly. So let's add up all these. And you can see that our balance sheet goes out of balance because of the fact that we're not reflecting that premium or discount that we paid over the old value for the equity investments here. So to fix this, we can just link to this in common shareholders equity. And now the balance sheet balances correctly. So that's the first step of this process. Most of this is straightforward. The non-controlling interest creation and the common shareholders equity adjustments are a little tricky. And you have to remember to factor in the new transaction debt and the cash that is used to fund this deal. Let's now go to part two and talk about the full consolidation on the three financial statements. We're going to assume that Parentco continues to own 70% of Subco over several years. The income statement is simple. We literally add together all of Parentco's numbers and all of Subco's numbers. And then we'll have to subtract one minus the ownership percentage times Subco's net income at the bottom. We'll also have to adjust for things like the interest expense on the new debt that is being used to fund this deal. Now, to save some time in this part, I have already combined off screen the financial statements of the parent co and subco for all the normal items. So revenue, for example, we're just taking the parent's number and then adding it to the subco's number here. I've already filled in the standard line items where it's just simple additions on the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement. I wanna focus more on the interesting items or ones that are slightly different now. To start with, we need to reflect the cost of acquiring this 40% stake, starting with the interest expense on the new debt to fund the deal. We're assuming that there is no foregone interest on cash because the interest rate is so low that it's not even worth factoring in. But for the debt, let's go down and take the new transaction debt balance from the previous period, and then let's multiply it by the 5% interest rate on debt that we've assumed up here. We can copy this across. The goodwill impairment, we'll just set to zero. This doesn't exist for either company, but we're including it just so Goodwill can link to something later on. For income taxes, we'll take pre-tax income and then we'll multiply by the parent's tax rate up here and put a negative sign in front of it. For net income, we can add up both of these and then copy these across. And then for equity investment earnings, so here we have to do a check or we should do a check rather. And we wanna check the ownership during the period up here. Now. If this is less than the minimum percentage required for consolidation, the 50% right here, then we want to take this percentage 
and we want to go over to Subco and take their net income from year two and multiply by that. Otherwise, we'll say zero. So right now, they're over 50% ownership, so this is going to be zero all the way across. For the net income attributable to non-controlling interest, it's pretty much the opposite. So we look at the ownership percentage up here in this year, and if this is greater than or equal to this minimum percentage required for consolidation, the 50%, then we do the opposite, and we put a negative sign in front. We say one minus the 70% here. We multiply it by subco's net income in this period. Otherwise, we say zero. And so now we have that standard adjustment at the bottom of the income statement, and that will give us net income to parent. So it's a little more complicated than the very simplified example in the beginning, but it's still the same basic concept with net income attributable to non-controlling interests. The cash flow statement gets more complicated, which is why we skipped it the first time around. But again, you can start by adding together most of the line items. And that is the part that is already here. We can add together deferred taxes for the parent and subco, same for all these changes in operating assets and liabilities, same for capital expenditures, debt issuances, debt repayments. So all this is fairly straightforward. I wanna focus again on the parts here that are actually different or which require adjustments. Normally with the dividends, when you combine them in real life, there will just be one single line item for parent co plus subco, but we prefer to list them separately. We'll have to adjust for net income and add it back in cash flow from operations. And then we'll also have to include subco's dividends times the ownership percentage in cash flow from operations because if parent co owns 70% of subco, it's not correct to subtract 100% of subco's dividends. We should really only get a net impact from that 30% of the dividends, the 30% that does not go to us. The 70% that subco issues though does go to us. We actually wanna add this back here. And then for the beginning cash, we also have to be careful to link to the post-transaction cash number. So let's go into the cash flow statement and make these adjustments. I'll start with net income to parent, linking to the income statement. Depreciation and amortization will go up and link to this and flip the sign. And we can copy both of these across. Goodwill impairment, equity investment earnings, and net income attributable to non-controlling interest. For these, we can just go up and flip the signs. So there isn't much to say about this. And we're just flipping these because these are all considered non-cash items. Now for the dividends received from partially owned companies, you might think that we have to check whether we have an equity investment or non-controlling interest here, but it's actually not necessary if you think about it, because regardless of how it's classified, if we own a percentage in another company, we always get a percentage of that company's dividends. If we own 20%, we get 20% of the company's dividends. If we own 70%, we get 70% of their dividends. So this will always be the same line item. Let's go over to Subco and go to their dividends down here in cell E81. We'll flip the sign on this, so this is positive to us, the parent company. And then we'll go up and multiply by the ownership percentage up here in this period, the 70% in cell H30. And we don't need the combined part there, so I'll just delete that and copy this across. Let's now sum up all of these. We have that. We already have cash flow from investing. For financing activities, we have many of these items because these are simple additions. The ones that are different include the new debt issuances. I'm gonna set this to zero because we assume no new debt after the initial transaction here. And then for the parent co common dividends paid, let's go over and link to their number right there. And then for subco, let's go over and link to their number right there. And one change I want to make here is with Subco, technically we should check the ownership percentage here. Specifically what I mean is we wanna check and make sure that we're actually consolidating the statements. So if we are at or above this 50% minimum, then we will show Subco's dividends. Otherwise, we'll just set this equal to zero. And then we can copy this across, so we have that. With all that set up, we can now add up everything here. The change in cash and cash equivalents, we'll just take these three sections. And then for the beginning cash, we'll link to the cash after the transaction closes here. I'm gonna add these up and then we can copy this across. And for beginning cash, I can just change it to equal the ending cash in each period here. Let's now go up to the balance sheet. Once again, I have some notes on what we're doing here. Most items are simple combinations. So all these working capital items, accounts receivable, inventory, even something like the operating lease assets and liabilities under US GAAP are fairly simple. So we can just add them together. 
but many of the items are not and require more complex treatment. So let's go through them now and see what to do here. Cash is gonna flow in from the bottom of the cash flow statement. So let's go and get that from down here where we calculated it. We can now add up total current assets. And then some of these other items here, net pp &E, goodwill, equity investments, these will have to be projected based on what's on the cash flow statement. One note is that for equity investments, it is zero for now, but we do wanna maintain it by linking in the equity investment net income and dividends just in case something here ever changes. With net pp &E, starting there, let's take the old number and then subtract depreciation and amortization, and then we'll subtract the capital expenditures, so we have all that. Copy this across. Goodwill, we'll take the old number and then subtract the goodwill impairment right here. And then for equity investments, as I said, we'll take the old number, we will go down and subtract the equity investment earnings, and then we'll just do a check again and look at the ownership percentage here. If this is less than our minimum percentage, meaning we actually have an equity investment, then we will subtract the dividends that we receive from it right here. Otherwise, I will say zero. And this is the same as what we covered in the tutorial on equity investments. And then we can just add up our total assets. Now moving to the other side, again, a lot of these items are simple combinations, but a few are not. Common shareholders equity will be a bit complicated. Let's start by looking at the total debt and the new transaction debt first. Total debt, we'll take the old number, we will add debt issuances and then debt repayments here. We're really subtracting the debt repayments. For new transaction debt, we'll take the old number and then we will add the new debt issuances. We can copy these across. Deferred tax liabilities, we'll take the old number and then add deferred taxes on the cash flow statement. We can then sum up all these, copy it across, and then total liabilities, we can do the same thing. Now, as I just said, the formula for common shareholders equity looks a bit complicated, but it's actually pretty much the same as what you always expect. We're taking the old number, adding net income to parent, subtracting parent co-dividends, and then factoring in stock issuances and stock purchases. Really, the only difference here is that we think it's best to only make the parent company's own standalone dividends flow in because the subco's dividends to the minority shareholders will go into the non-controlling interest here. So for common shareholders equity, we'll take this number, we will add our net income to parent, we'll go down and also factor in the common dividends paid, and then the stock issuances and stock repurchases down here. And then for non-controlling interest, this is probably the most complicated formula here, We'll take the old non-controlling interest, we'll add the net income to non-controlling interest. We will factor in the dividends received from partially owned companies if the parent owns over 50%. And then we'll also include the subco dividends. Let's take a look at how this looks. So we'll take this number, we will factor in the net income attributable to non-controlling interests. We will then also include the subco dividends paid. So this is 100% of subco's dividends right here that we're subtracting out. And then, We'll go up and look at the ownership percentage. And if this is greater than or equal to the 50% up here, then we also want to add these dividends received from the partially owned companies. If you think about the net impact here, we're subtracting 100% of their dividends, and then we're adding back the portion that goes to us. So really, we're effectively just subtracting the portion that does not go to us, the portion that goes to the 30% minority shareholders here. And if we're not at or above that 50%, we'll just say zero for this part. You can sum up everything here. We can also sum up our total liabilities and equity, and then we can copy all this across. So we have that. And that's it for this process. It may look a little bit confusing. Some of the formulas are tricky, but conceptually, I don't think it is really that difficult. The way to think about this is that the non-controlling interest is kind of like a mini shareholders equity for the minority shareholders in subco. So in other words, that group that owns the 30%, the non-parent shareholders only the portion of dividends that goes to the non-parent shareholders gets subtracted here. And so just like with normal common shareholders equity, we're adding net income and subtracting dividends, but we're doing it only for a specific group, namely that group that owns 30% of subco that we do not own. In this final segment here, I wanna briefly touch on non-controlling interest and valuation. The short answer here is that when you're going from equity value to enterprise value, you have to add non-controlling interest because they represent another investor group. And if you look at some of the examples that we have, such as the one for Vivendi, you'll see that non-controlling interest is always a factor in this equity value to enterprise value bridge. Effectively, the non-controlling interest represents another investor group because 
it represents the minority shareholders in this majority owned company. So although we don't own that segment, effectively we can draw on their resources and that's why they count as another investor group. Also, since metrics like EBITDA, EBIT, and revenue include 100% of Subco's financials, for consistency, enterprise value must include 100% of Subco. If we don't add non-controlling interest, then enterprise value includes only 60% or 70% or 80% of Subco. And you saw this firsthand with the simple demonstration in the beginning. We're including 100% of Subco's EBIT and EBITDA here, even though we own only 70% of Subco. So enterprise value has to be consistent, and that's why we need to add the non-controlling interest, the 30% times the 100 of Subco right here to get the full value of 100% of Subco in enterprise value. You should ideally use the market value for everything here if you can. If not, or if it's not available, the book value is fine and it's not the end of the world in most cases, as long as the non-controlling interest is relatively small for the company. That's about it, so let's do a quick recap and summary. We started off by giving you the overall view of non-controlling interest and how the statements are consolidated 100% with some adjustments for net income at the bottom of the income statement and some adjustments for dividends on the cash flow statement. We then went over this process of how the non-controlling interest gets created in the first place and how there's goodwill that gets added. We remove the equity investments, we reflect the cash and debt used to fund the deal. And then of course we record the new non-controlling interest and the adjustment within common shareholders equity for the premium or discount to the previous value at which the company purchased a minority stake. With the full consolidation on the three financial statements, overall, it was pretty straightforward. It just extended from the simple example where we adjust for the percent of net income that does not go to us at the bottom of the income statement. We flip it and add it back on the cash flow statement. And here, we wanna make sure that effectively only the dividends that do not go to us, that do not go to the parent, are a cash outflow. Most of the other items we could simply add together. We prefer to show the dividends of the parent and subco separately if possible. And then we went to the balance sheet and you saw how all the items here linked in. The hardest parts are probably getting the formulas for common shareholders equity and the non-controlling interest correct. With the non-controlling interest, the way to think about it is that net income to the non-controlling interest and dividends to the minority shareholders in Subco both flow into here. And as usual, net income increases this and the dividends issued reduce it. But here we're looking at it for just a specific group, not for the entire combined company. And then I just told you about non-controlling interest and valuation. The short answer is yes, you do have to factor them in for consistency purposes and also because they do represent another investor group. If you can use the market value and find that, that's great. If not, the book value is fine, especially if it is a very small percentage of the parent company's size as it is in this example for Vivendi. That's about it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know more about non-controlling interests and you can more effectively answer questions about them in interviews and understand intuitively how they work.